Chapter 26 Catherine the Great Princess Catherine comes to Russia. Over in Russia, the Empress Catherine the Great watched in horror as king and aristocrats died by the guillotine. Catherine the Great had come to the throne of Russia thirty years before. Like Peter the Great, who ruled before her, Catherine admired Western ideas. But she was still firmly convinced that kings ruled because God gave them power. France, she told one of her ministers, was going to ruin. Catherine may have believed that God gave kings and empresses their power, but the empress herself had come to the throne by very human means. Catherine wasn't even a Russian. Her father had been the prince of a little German state, and her mother was Swedish. But her mother's cousin had married the daughter of the great Russian emperor, Peter the Great, and their son, Peter Ulrich, had been declared the heir. The Empress Elizabeth, Peter Ulrich's aunt, had seized the Russian throne years before. She thought that young Catherine would be the perfect wife for her nephew. When Catherine was fifteen, the Empress sent a message to Germany inviting the young princess to come and visit Russia. Catherine's mother, Johanna, was thrilled. If her daughter married the future Tsar, she would be the mother of a queen. But Catherine's father shook his head in worry. You will have to become a member of the Russian Orthodox Church, he warned Catherine. We have always been followers of Martin Luther's teachings. You must promise me never to leave the Lutheran Church. Catherine promised. She wasn't sure she wanted to marry Peter Ulrich anyway. She had met him once before when he was ten, and she remembered an odd, small, white-faced boy, bad-tempered, and full of strange twitches. Even though he was only ten, he drank so much wine at dinner that he had to be carried away from the table. He had been unfriendly and rude to his servants, and seemed to want only to play toy soldiers with one of his attendants. But the thought of a crown fascinated Catherine. And what was Peter like now that he was older? Catherine was willing to go and see. So she packed her clothes, and with her mother, set off for Russia's capital city, St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg was almost a thousand miles away, and their road lay through the coldest, bleakest part of Europe. They traveled for six weeks. The roads disappeared under snow and ice and mud. They had to sleep at country inns, where the guests piled together for warmth, while dogs and chickens nosed around the straw-strewn floors. Catherine's hands and feet swelled from frostbite. But when they finally arrived in St. Petersburg, they were welcomed with warm cloaks and celebration. The Empress's fur-lined sled was waiting to whisk them to Moscow, where Peter was waiting. Finally, Catherine arrived at the enormous, candle-lit mansion where Peter stood in the front hall to welcome her. He was much taller and more handsome than when she had seen him last, and he was delighted to see her. I wish I could have harnessed myself to your sled so that you would have been here sooner, he exclaimed. But the more time Catherine spent with Peter, the less she liked him. He was rude to the servants and courtiers. When he went to church, he made unpleasant noises and told loud jokes during the service. Even though he would rule Russia one day, he refused to speak Russian. Instead, he spoke German and told the Russians around him that he wished he could live in Prussia, a German state that Russians hated. But everyone around her seemed to expect her to marry Peter. The Empress Elizabeth was a big, frightening woman who flew into terrifying rages at her servants, and Catherine was afraid to tell her that she didn't really like Peter. She tried to tell her mother, but Johanna was looking forward to becoming the mother-in-law of a czar. She scoffed at Catherine's doubts. Catherine's father would have agreed with her, but he was a thousand miles away. Too afraid to refuse, Catherine agreed to convert to the Russian Orthodox Church, and to be betrothed to Peter. The two went through a long, elaborate engagement ceremony. Catherine was given the title of a Russian Grand Duchess. Suddenly, everyone had to kneel in front of her, call her Your Imperial Highness, and kiss her hand. Four months after the engagement ceremony, Peter Ulrich came down with smallpox. Instantly, Catherine was whisked away to a distant place so that she wouldn't catch the disease, too. In those days, smallpox killed millions. Peter grew sicker and sicker. Smallpox sores covered his face and body. He wasn't expected to live. But he survived. 
When Catherine saw him again, she gasped in horror. His face was swollen. His skin was a mass of scars. He was barely recognizable. He had become hideous, Catherine wrote in her diary. My blood ran cold at the sight of him. And just at this time, the Empress Elizabeth announced that it was time to set the date for the wedding. Catherine dreaded the day of the ceremony, but she was afraid to break off her engagement. So the two were married in an enormous celebration that the Empress had planned for months. Ambassadors from all of Europe were there. The feasting went on for hours. Catherine was the wife of the future Tsar, and she was miserable. Peter didn't improve after marriage. As a matter of fact, his behavior grew so strange that the Russian court whispered, He's going mad! His scars covered a face that was always grimacing and twitching. He talked loudly in church, insulted visiting ambassadors, and giggled uncontrollably at serious occasions. He liked to pour wine on the heads of his servants and play with his wooden soldiers. He ignored his wife. Catherine had no friends, and her mother Johanna had returned home after the wedding. She spent nine lonely years reading books of history and philosophy, books about military tactics, books about the emperors of Rome and their strategies for ruling their empire. She made friends with the army officers. She rode through the streets of St. Petersburg and heard the Russian people murmur about her beauty. Next to weak, spindly, repulsive Peter, Catherine looked like a true queen. Catherine's life at court grew lonelier and harder. Peter insulted her in public and threatened to send her into exile. When Catherine had her first baby, after being married to Peter for nine years, the Empress Elizabeth took the baby as soon as it was born and swept out of the room, commanding everyone to follow her. Catherine was left alone, exhausted and cold. No one even brought her a drink of water for three hours. The Empress had decided to raise the future heir to the throne herself. She named the little boy Paul and put his cradle in her own room. Catherine didn't even see her baby for six weeks. Catherine was furious, but lying in her bed, she began to think. The Empress Elizabeth was growing older and sicker. Peter was a fool and a madman. She was the mother to the heir of the throne, and she was a strong, intelligent woman. The Russian people liked her. The army respected her. When the Empress Elizabeth died, why shouldn't Catherine rule in the place of her bad-tempered, childish husband? When she was well again, Catherine began to make her plans. She reread her books about the Roman emperors and the ways they controlled their people. She spent hours talking to the Empress's officials. They were impressed by her intelligence and her understanding of affairs of state. Meanwhile, Peter drank more than ever. He staggered through the palace, screaming at the top of his lungs, beating his dogs and sometimes his servants in uncontrollable rages. The old empress began to grow weaker. In December of 1761, sixteen years after Catherine's wedding, she took to her bed. Soon she was unable to move. She summoned Peter to her bedside. Rule Russia well, she whispered. Be kind to the servants. Watch over your son. Her eyes closed, but she still breathed. The whole court waited for days while the old woman lay motionless. Finally, on Christmas Day, the Empress died. Peter Ulrich had become Tsar Peter III of Russia. Catherine did nothing. She was expecting another baby, and she was too tired and weak to lead a revolt. But she had waited sixteen years in this cold, strange country. She could wait a little bit longer.